Since 1980, Edmund Skellings has been Poet Laureate of Florida. Since the early 1970s, he's experimented with electronics to expand the horizons of poetry through multimedia. Today, he's known for his animated computer poems, some of which have appeared on television worldwide. For Skellings, technology and art are simply two sides of the coin of reality. It's a big step to hang your shingle out for poet. My, my Lord, you hang your shingle out for lawyer, you hang your shingle out for physician, but to hang your shingle out and say, poet on it, you better be ready for all kinds of upturned eyebrows and uh, it isn't probably until you're getting uh, ain't half ancient and decrepit and starting to feel the arthritis gathering that anybody finally says, okay, we give up, you've arm wrestled us for 60 years, you're a poet. The first thing you have to do as a performer is learn to live with criticism because the first thing you get is everybody telling you what to do. And once you've learned to live with criticism, the next thing you have to do, and this is much more difficult, is learn to live with applause. You have to learn to eliminate what that applause is saying also, so that neither criticism nor praise has any effect on what you do at all. And so I've been at it all my life, trying never, ever to write the same poem over again in different words, because that's the next danger that you start to repeat, because once you know how to do it, oh, you can do another one kind of like it. You can fake it. Don't fake it. Not if you want to stay in the ball game and be respected by the other poets, because you're going to find, if you strike out to be a writer, that your real audience is the other writers. Frost said, somebody asked him once, how do you know that you're a poet? And he said, well, when you're 85 years old, you look back on your life and you say, well, I wrote poems all that time, so I must have been one. After demonstrating his color poetry at the first National Educational Computing Conference, he was invited by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory to participate in an educational television series named Adventure of the Mind. I thought that trees and ponds and flowers were the things of poetry. Well, no, I don't think they are. The, those are the things of the poet's life, the same way they're the things of anyone's life. But the things of poetry are words. Words are not things, and words are the poet's paintbrush and his medium. But when we say tree, that strange construction of tree is not the thing. And a poem can't pretend to present you life. It can present you thoughts about it and help you recreate life. But remember, it's orthographic, and a poet is bound to language and the melodies of language. And those are the things of poetry more than the lake he talks about or the tree he sees. The creative process fascinated Skellings. For Skellings, technology and art are simply two sides of the coin of reality. What being an artist means is a life dedicated to art. It's dedicated to explicating the world that you have seen and felt to other people. A poem is a long piece of writing in small. It's a, a Robert Frost says somewhere that you have to live a life at a great rate to get enough life inside yourself so that you will secrete a little poetry. Uh, uh, poetry is so compressed down. It's like the great photographs we take. Oh, we burn up film with our Kodaks and we take pictures of everything. But most of them we say, oh, that's not very good, that's not very good. But once in a while we get a particular image that sums up that wedding, that ceremony, that time in our lives, that baseball game, whatever it is. It comes together for us, and a poem is like that. It comes together for us in words, so the writer's personal experience is summarized and made clear to himself as he does the many drafts necessary, one draft after another. One more thing. It is not the art object, that painting, that in the end matters. One must get into the process of creating 
That's where the real fun is. That's where the joy is. As Robert Frost says to you, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. He says we must somehow fasten for the ear of the imagination. We must fasten the rhythms and the sounds of speech patterns and get them into the poem. Pieces of poems that are so wonderful stick in your mind like touchstones for the rest of your life so that you can live by it and talk by it and hopefully write by it and write your own personal experiences down for someone else to understand you better from. Can you do any better than to explain yourself while you're alive to other people and perhaps let them understand themselves a little better so that when they read you, they say, oh, I am not alone. This poet has spoken for me. It may be that that is the central skill of being a writer. It's living the life of the writer or the life of the painter the life of attempting to express yourself and the world you see to other people. Uh, poetry is the hardest to write, therefore it's more of a challenge to the writer. Uh, you know, in a novel you can get sort of lost in a character and go on mm -hmm. for three pages and tell how, what the sky looked like and what kind of clothing people were wearing. It's uh, almost a poem then, it's almost the, the ultimate distillation of an idea. Yes, if a novelist gets good enough and he says something about our essential character, we finally call him a poet. Uh, we call Hemingway a poet. Einstein called himself a poet, uh, surprising many people. He said that the essential nature of his discovery is poetic. And when you go in uh, and turn on Florida Power and Light on, in your uh, kitchen, uh, it's because of a, yeah. a poetic insight that's giving you that light to right. uh, your life. So you see, the poet is looking for a kind of equation that Wallace Stevens calls, in defining what poetry is all about, the essence of creativity, he says that poetry is abstraction blooded. Abstraction blooded. Uh, you move, a poet's attempt is to move from abstractions, like love, and to bring that down to a place where he can get a grip on it. And that's what poets are trying to do. They're trying to get people to feel about the ideas. Wordsworth says that the real purpose, the real function of a poet of the imagination is to use the imagination to speculate into the nature of reality. It takes a metaphor, an understandable metaphor, to be able to pry away at the reality and see the present for what it is. Somehow, uh, if a poet can put forth some explanations or try some speculations, it's almost each poem is like an experiment. And maybe one experiment, one poem doesn't do it, but perhaps if he puts 10 together or 20, you'll catch his drift. Lifelong learning is not only for the scientist and the new discoveries of the technology of a particular time. Lifelong learning is a constant discovery for a writer, too. It is a discovery of himself as much as the heart of others. Uh, the skills a writer needs on his job are not only a good eye for detail, but a good ear for speech rhythms and sounds of the time he lives in. One of the other skills a writer needs is a large memory for emotion. Not only the memory of actions, but the memory of emotions. What we call the feel of a situation. What my friend the poet Snodgrass calls uh, 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 what it feels like to be alive in a situation. And you've all had situations that moved you, that summarized something for you. An abstraction called love made concrete in a particular person. Remember Robert Burns says, my love is like a red, red rose. He does not say, my love is like a rose. He does not say, my love is like a red rose. He says, my love is like a red, red rose. Red, red. That's what love is like. His love was red, red. So if you can say that and communicate it to people, you've really said something. My poetry 
has been about the sciences. Milton chose religion to base his Paradise Lost on. I chose uh, the sciences to write about. Uh, you'll find uh, microwave, uh, little microwave radiators in my poems, and you'll find DNA, and you'll find people digging up bones. Uh, people talk a lot about the arts and sciences as if they were opposites, uh, or, or perhaps they were opposites, but they are not. They are the same search for the truth. One simply starts out internally and subjectively, and the other one starts out objectively. But we want to know who we are. We want to know how we got here. We want to know what this planet is all about. We want to know about the, about the universe. We want to know where it came from and where it's going. And we all try to participate in what it feels like to be alive and what it thinks like to be alive. And you make your choice, either the sciences or the arts. Now, a lot of people get them mixed up because uh, they don't realize that the technologies come out of the sciences. There's no such thing as computer science. What there are are sciences. And out of the sciences come the technologies, and computing is a technology. The same way out of the arts come the poems. Poems and technologies, paintings and technologies, those are the fruits of the sciences and the humanities. I suppose it was Mr. Gutenberg uh, and the first Bible and the invention of the printing press that uh, brought, made poetry more black and white. Uh, until then, everyone illuminated manuscripts. Uh, poets could color their language, color great big capital letters with people inside them looking out of the O, and uh, everybody had a good time. There was a lot of art. The advent of the computer, uh, since the color is already in the television set, we can run computer programs that manipulate that color and bring color back to, uh, back to the alphabet. I believe there should be no barrier between the humanities and the sciences. I think poets should understand and use the latest technology to communicate their poetry to their audience. I use supercomputers to do color animations to illustrate the ideas and emotions of my poems. I also use computers to edit my voice for creative effects. Young people like the television imagery to go along with the images and the voice. Older readers like to have the text before them when a poet is reading. My reviewers have always accused me of attempting to widen the audience to include just about everybody, and the technology helps me to do that. I like poems that transform the ordinary. You know, I like poems that get excited and exciting, and uh, I started writing a poem one day about because you know I didn't have any ideas at all and that's of course the best time it's when you can't think of anything so I started writing well what am I you know what am I doing well I'm going back and forth from I would sit inside at the typewriter and nothing would be there for 10 minutes 10 minutes nothing I'd go outside I'd sit under my tree and I'd look at the tree and then I'd come back in I'd try it again nothing this went on all morning long and I said, well, so I finally wrote, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And I kept saying that over and over until suddenly I realized that there was a, the wood of the chair I was sitting in and the wood of that tree. And I was going back and forth, bouncing. And suddenly the wood started again. And I started to think of all the wood of the world and, and, and the walls. And it became transformed for a little while. And I lived for a moment in this very excited kind of, new way of looking at the ordinary. The ordinary was no longer ordinary. Oh God, I hear the forests falling. Timbers moan in the holds of the ships. Spars sing in the wings of planes. All the toboggans in the hills are rushing. Skis are hissing. The great woods of the world are howling. The pines of the walls encircle me. The polished years are shining like brown bones. I sink into the chair. The tree enters the house. Now all the dryads are dancing. The, uh, the, the poem that I'm looking at here on my desk is yeah. called the Lost Airman. 
because I've been a very, very uh, unlost airman. <laughs> I've been flying for a long time in, in my life, and uh, and I've flown my own planes. Yeah. So I've been in Alaska, up in north, north Alaska, and all the way around, and all the way down, and all the way out <laughs> the other side of the days. Uh, the lost airman, this is me. Okay. I can't fly anymore because of heart troubles. One valve is fluttering in the blood wind. The whole hangar suffers from a long neglect. And I say, nothing is like the sweet quiet of a Midwest dawn. You wet your feet and the bottoms of your blue overalls with dew shine from the morning and have time for a slow coffee and a slow read of the old happenings of the world's yesterday. And after the long yawn of the huge barn doors, arms stretch out in the sun's light like wings, one can drum a hand's fingers on the lacquer fabric, typing nothing anyone else will read or understand. And after the sputter and the run up, after the roll, the lift, the throttle back to cruise. There is a little minute to look down at fog wisp and mist puff. It is a real wonder to look level at heaven. And I don't know why I woke thinking of the white sparrow skeleton I saw once stuck in the black roof tar but I can't fly anymore because of my heart's troubles. And it is hard to remember the oil odor on the clover. stuff and there are people in the audience and they're all listening to uh, me uh, talk about my poetry and, and other poetry and other things like we're doing today and, and I did that and they they all stood up and, and applauded me and I said oh my you're applauding me and they said yes we're applauding you because You've done a good job for us. And I said, oh, thank you. You've made me a happy man today. 